Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening, wherever you may be. I'm Michael Kugelman, the Asia Program Deputy Director and Senior Associate for South Asia at the Wilson Center. Thank you uh, very much for joining me for today's event. Three years ago, the Wilson Center, in partnership with South Asia Democracy Watch, launched a new annual lecture series in honor of Asma Jahangir, the heroic and courageous Pakistani human rights advocate who passed away in 2018. The goal of the lecture series is to feature an annual address by a distinguished scholar or opinion leader who addresses issues of democracy and human rights in South Asia. Dr. Aisha Jalal was the inaugural speaker in 2019. In 2020, it was Dr. Aisha Sadiqa. And this year, we are delighted to have with us Dr. Anita Weiss, uh, who will be providing this year's lecture. Dr. Weiss is truly one of the great contemporary scholars of Pakistan, and she will be properly introduced in just a bit. Dr. Weiss will be speaking about responses to extremism in Pakistan and specifically local responses, actions, advocacy, and expressions of response to a longstanding challenge in Pakistan, that of extremism. And this is a critically important issue to discuss, and that is because the global media and ample commentary and analysis and scholarship tend to focus more on extremism itself, and especially its causes, manifestations, and perpetrators than on responses to extremism. How are Pakistani communities pushing back against extremism? What does this response look like? And what does it mean for the country, for Pakistan? That will be the focus of our discussion today, which will be drawn in part on Dr. Weiss's new book on the same issue. This spirit within the grassroots segments of Pakistan of countering extremism, the pushback, contestation, even in the face of the threats of doing so, this is something that resonates with the work and life and legacy of Asma Jahangir. She was all about pushing back and asserting the importance of rights and cultural authenticity, among other things. And this is why we're so delighted to have Dr. Weiss giving the 2021 Asma Jihangir lecture. I'm now going to turn things over to my friend, uh, Kaiser Abbas. Kaiser is the executive director of South Asia Watch, a, a, a nonprofit organization that uh, promotes social justice, human rights, and equality in South Asia through educational programs, conferences, and symposia, pardon me, South Asia Democracy Watch. Um, and it is the Wilson Center's partner in this annual lecture series. Kaiser will say a few words. He will introduce Dr. Weiss, as well as our other guest speaker, Aftab Siddiqui, who we'll hear from later. Uh, we'll then have Dr. Weiss's lecture, followed by a panel discussion moderated by me, and then a Q&A. And so if you in the audience have a question, please email it to asia at wilsoncenter.org or tweet it to at Asia Program. And that's all one word. Uh, Kaiser, over to you. Thank you, Mike, for your uh, introduction. As you said, this is the third year we are celebrating the activist of Pakistan, Asma Jangir. Uh, we started this lecture series about three years ago. And I would like to thank you, uh, Michael, and Wilson Center for collaborating on organizing this event. Also, I would like to thank our board members of South Asia Democracy Watch, especially our uh, president, Amir Makhani, who has been very supportive in continuing this lecture series. Uh, with that, we have an, uh, uh, a scholar, very distinguished scholar, uh, Dr. Anita Wise. Uh, as you know, there are several scholars who are just overnight scholars who visit the area for once and twice, and then they become expert. Anita Wise is not that kind of scholar. She visits Pakistan frequently. She lives with the people. She attends cultural events. She talks to them. She interviews them. So she's a kind of very different kind of uh, uh, scholar who also knows, uh, as I know, Urdu very well. She talks in Urdu and talk to people, and it makes easier to communicate culturally in the area. Anita Wise uh, has a doctorate in sociology from UC Berkeley. 
and she has been teaching at the University of Oregon since 1988. She specializes in South Asia, Middle East, and the Islamic world. To her credit, she wrote several books on Pakistan on social, cultural, and women's issues. And some of her books are Pathways to Power, The Domestic Politics of South Asia, Power and Civil Society of Pakistan, Interpreting Islam, Modernity, and Women's Rights in Pakistan. So you can see she has been writing on social, cultural, and women's issue in Pakistan, not only in Pakistan, but on South Asia and the Middle East too. Today, she will talk on how people are resisting extremism in Pakistan through fine arts, poetry, education, and activism. Here, uh, presentation is based, her presentation here is based on a recent book, Countering Violent Extremism in Pakistan, local action and local voices and this book as i say uh, i will say is a result of two years of his, her research in pakistan she visited urban areas uh, rural areas she uh, visited festivals participated in it and talked to people and interviewed them thank you dr anita for your presentation today I think that sounds like I should start, so I will. Um, thank you, first of all, thank you very much, Michael, Kessler, and others for inviting me to participate today. This is indeed a very moving emotional experience for me to be selected to give the Asma Jahangir Memorial Lecture. I knew Asma ever since the first time I arrived in Pakistan in Lahore in early 1978 as a graduate student on the Berkeley Urdu language program. And from the outset, I was deeply dedicated to human rights issues. Some of the first news articles I had asked my tutors to help me read were about the emergent Khawatin Mahaziamal or Women's Action Forum movement. So meeting with Asma and her sister Hina Jelani were always high points for me in Lahore. Personally, I gained so many insights from talking with them, hearing their concerns. I knew them as they were establishing their law office, AGHS, which was the first all-female law firm providing legal aid to vulnerable and marginalized groups in Pakistan. And also talking with them as they were involved in conceptualizing the Pakistan Human Rights Commission. After those early years, our physical paths didn't cross as much as Asma and Hina became involved in everyday, on-the-ground, vital legal concerns, and I followed a more scholarly path. But there was still a lot of crossover as I followed their work closely and wrote about how their work manifested in enhanced empowerment for women. After completing my book on women's lives in the walled city of Lahore, I actually lived in the walled city in 1987 for nearly a year, and I saw them a lot during that time. So after completing that book on women's lives in the walled city of Lahore, I did field research in poor slums and kachiabatis elsewhere in the city of Lahore. It was interesting for me because wherever I went, women would tell me about the help, the assistance they would get from Asma Bibi the Daftar, which is, you know, Asma, Asma's office, really. It was a law office she had set up in many of these different slums that enabled women there to learn about their legal rights, especially their biggest concerns were related to marriage, divorce, and inheritance. It's interesting. So I met, when I met with people at Huendo Kur in Peshawar and Biswa, but Batai Social Watch Advocacy in Kherpur in Upper Sindh, in the course of doing the field research for my new book project, which actually took three years to do. So as I met with them for this new book project and I heard about their undertakings, their activities really resonated with me because I knew about how Asma had taken her knowledge of the law and translated it into social activism. 
to educate and empower those who had been ignored and overlooked in society. These are themes along with the overarching spirit and dedication that USMA had to do this that I kept, that I kept finding and emerging in many of the activities of people and groups that I write about in my group, in my book, sorry. Indeed, even the dedication of my book, which is quote, to the courageous souls, the sparks of hope, who have sought in their own paths to stand up to hatred, destruction, and evil in Pakistan, end quote. Even that dedication speaks to who Asma Jahangir was and her commitment to creating a more positive future for Pakistan. As I wrote in my book's introduction, I hadn't intended to write another book after my last one, which was my seventh, that was completed in March 2014. That was Interpreting Islam, Modernity, and Women's Rights in Pakistan. I promised myself that I would never write another one. It's a lot of time consuming work and was just no longer on my agenda. But then the attack on the Army Public School in Peshawar happened, December 16th, 2014, nearly exactly seven years ago now. I was sitting at a friend's house in Islamabad when then Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif appeared on television to announce the attack. Using his commonly seen somber face, he stated, of Sosheh, which can be translated as sad, but most often means too bad. I threw a cushion at the television, careful not to break my friend's TV, decrying this attitude that it was not enough, not sufficient for the prime minister of my adopted country to say this was too bad. This deplorable act that killed over 140 people in a children's school was beyond the scope of saying too bad. It had to be called out for being horrific, monstrous, and that everything about it was against Pakistan. But in my horror, I also realized that this was not an act of the Pakistan I knew, that Pakistanis were also mortified and were standing up all over the country for what was right, just, and authentic. Hence the idea to write this book was born. I spoke with friends and colleagues who directed me to others, and my eyes were open to what could be deemed acts of acts of subversion occurring throughout the country, but what are in actuality, acts of reclaiming identity and authenticity. And that is actually a charge that Asma was, was, uh, that was often lodged against Asma Jahangir, you know, the, the question of subversion. And she was actually trying to reclaim identity, authenticity, and also legal rights. So as I was saying, this is nationalism. What I was writing about, this is nationalism in its truest form. People all over Pakistan asserting they want their cultural identity back, asserting they want their society intact, and to throw off the bondages of hatred, violence, and fear that at least for a while seemed to break out at any time in Pakistan. Now we know that violent extremism has manifest in myriad ways over the past decades in Pakistan. In response, the Pakistan state and military had sought to counter this extremism through different strategies that have been fraught with problems. On the other hand, non-state actors, individuals, NGOs, and the like, they have been engaging in various kinds of social neg negotiations and actions to lessen the violence and also recapture indigenous cultural identity and often in very inventive ways. So as I was saying, the attack on the army public school was a pivotal moment in Pakistan's public consciousness about terrorism. And it really was a very provocative moment resulting in an overwhelming outcry that something absolutely had to be done now. The focus of this book, however, is not about why some people have become extremists and engaged in violence. It's not addressing the foundation of this extremism, how it began, what forces encouraged it, nor the roles distinct groups have played in encouraging, promoting, or joining the violence. There are many conspiracy theories in Pakistan about this. And while one could spend a lifetime to get to the bottom of it, even then, much of what is unknown would remain unknown. 
Salim Shahzad dedicated his life, the late journalist dedicated his life to trying to understand this. And of course, he was caught up in the web of this all and, and died trying to learn this. So as I was saying, that one could, much of what is unknown would always remain unknown. Many people in Pakistan had tried to push me to explore this further, but I absolutely refuse because to do so valorizes these acts. Instead, what I explore in the book are the laudatory efforts of Pakistanis who want their culture back, their lives back, and wish to live collectively in a future without violence. These are not weapons of the weak, to use James Scott's terminology of everyday kinds of resistance the disempowered have always used in a culture to resist oppression, but rather these are new innovative acts being used either to recapture local identity or to contribute to creating a new syncretic one. My concern about the actions of the relatively well-funded state actors in Pakistan, the political government and the military, is that the focus has been entirely on targeted people committing violent acts to hunt them down and kill them. As the removal of one small tumor does not eliminate cancer, although it may slow it down in the short term, the state actor's strategy has not halted incidents of violent extremism in the long term. In addition, fine lines, and some people decry that no lines, exist between some state agents and some extremist actors. Each death evokes multiple people to seek revenge, and the growing deterioration of trust in the state, provoked in part by the politically rooted good Taliban, bad Taliban rhetoric, further diminishes the long-term results of sweeping attacks. Extremist groups in Pakistan seem to rebound quickly, and they retain a public presence, sometimes on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the like, that's especially attractive to disaffected young idealists. So as I was saying, this research does not focus on the devastation, but instead on what I seek to valorize, the various ways that local people are responding, taking stands, recapturing their culture, and saying stop to the violent extremism that has manifest over the past decade or even longer in Pakistan. They are grasping what has been indigenous cultural identity and then through distinct actions that are reinterpreting it as a product of history, culture, and power. They are transformatively affecting the dynamism of contemporary society. So in this book, I explore a representative sample of what local people are engaged in. As I said, the sparks of hope that local people are creating to counter violent extremism. And in doing so, we observe not only what people are doing, but also how they are creating alternative narratives about culture and identity. This book is also designed to celebrate what is flourishing in cultural performances, music, social activism, and the like in Pakistan today because of people's commitment to take stands against extremism. Much of this book's subject matter is hardly known about even within Pakistan. I've met many people who have said to me, I knew about some of this, but not all of it, or not even most of it. I argue that what is occurring today is a concerted effort by Pakistanis themselves to bring people together at the public level to reject extremism, to recapture their cultural values and identity, and to celebrate their society. The reality is that a great number of individuals and groups in Pakistan are engaged in doing this, and that each chapter seeks to demonstrate those actions and voices that best characterize these efforts. Many more had to be admitted for the sake of brevity, of brevity and for that, it was a judgment call. So in the three years I spent going all over Pakistan, back roads, places I had never been to or never imagined ever going to, I found local people responding quite powerfully, standing up to counter violent extremism through music, art, writing, or whatever means inspires them. I hadn't thought about the means at the outset. I was just finding out what was going on. And I found also that the attack on the army public school had had a huge influence on getting people to actually stand up and act. 
we find a new generation of Pashto poets who have grown up directly opposing violence. When Geo Television reports on bombings in Peshawar, in the background, crowds are often heard singing Pashto anti-war and resistance poetry that speaks out against hypocrisy, unrestrained power, and oppression. Their Sindhi counterparts hold on strongly to traditions of interfaith harmony laid out in the poetry of Sachal Sarmas and Shabda Latif Batai, and celebrated today in the poetry of Hafiz Nizamani, Khalil Kambar, Sef Samejo, and, Is and Ishak Samejo. Writing poetry that enables people to process the violence occurring around them and empowering these same people to stand up to oppression to that violence is formidable. So too is reminding people through art that local culture has value and peace is possible. These kinds of actions affect people's mindsets, enabling them to make choices to stand up for their society and against violent extremism. Interactive theater enables audiences to finish the dialogues of plays that address timely and compelling social issues, while children are empowered to choose the endings of the online Pazban comic book stories. The Lal Band travels throughout Punjab, encouraging children to stay in school so they can build Pakistan's future, while Karan Khan in his Peshawar Zalmi cricket anthem inspires Peshawar's youth to stand up and celebrate not only cricket, but themselves and their communities. Sef Samejo created the annual two-day Lauti Melo in Interior Sindh as an opportunity to talk, talk, talk about peace during the day and celebrate peace, unity, and harmony through music at night. Shima Kermani and activists from the Hyderabad Women's Action Forum defiantly performed the Damal Lal Shabazz calendar's shrine in Sewan in February 2017, four days after violent extremists sought to destroy it as an emblem of Sufism and killed nearly 85 people in the attack. The walls of Karachi evoke powerful images that speak to cultural cohesiveness in a way similar to the artwork on the walls of Bahaulpur in southern Punjab. And the bus stops created by the Lahore Biennale project provides workers traveling under the harsh summer sun or bitter winter rains with the sense that someone in their community cares to give them shelter. Religious leaders are actively engaged in creating communities to talk with each other and bring messages of interfaith harmony to their constituencies and revisit what is the true message of Pakistan. While Pakhtuns organize for rights under the banner of PTM, the Pakhtun Tahafiz movement, and minorities mobilized through numerous forums. We see the long-term investments in promoting peace through innovative curricula in the Bachachan schools in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and the Zoya Science Schools in Southern Punjab. And they result in working class children imagining themselves as actors helping build the country's future, as opposed to being ignored bystanders, a common sentiment among their parents today. Entities like Karachi's The Second Floor, Lahore's Books and Beans, as well as The Last Word, and Hyderabad's Khana Badosh provide venues for local people to have a voice and add to the requiem of activities to promote harmony and cohesiveness. While Peshawar's Khwendokur and Arangi's uh, pilot project champion long-term incentives to promote participation, self-reliance, and unity. Importantly, they are all doing so with no expectations of support or assistance from either the government of Pakistan or from the military. As I wrote in my book, state actors could learn important lessons from these non-state actors' playbooks. It's not about wiping out opposition, but rather about transforming how people think about their own society. Perhaps violent extremists are too caught up in the tropes that they believe, but people surrounding them can envision an alternative future and not support the extremist rants because they believe in something else now. As it is in transforming how people think about their own society, 
that we find one of Asma Jahangir's critical legacies. Because of her work and all that she did, greater percentages of people no longer think of daughters as properties, that dismissing women's rights is acceptable, and that being ignorant of the law should be the norm. So for the remainder <coughs> of today's talk, and I'm actually not sure how much more time I should be taking for this, but I thought it would be helpful to highlight three kinds of actions that exemplify the kinds of activities in which Asma Jahangir has been engaged, what she had hoped to accomplish, and even to extend what she did to how others are conceptualizing their actions. So these three arenas that I had intended to talk about now are poetry that speaks truth to power, the transformative impact of education in changing social values that we see, especially in the Bachachan education um, system and the Zoya science schools in Southern Punjab, and how religious leaders themselves are taking stands to counter extremism. What I think I'd like to do with the time remaining to me though, is talk about the first one right now, poetry that speaks truth to power. Um, I focused on, in the book, I focus on Pashto poetry and Sindhi poetry as resistance poetry. And I explained that extensively and I won't take our time now to give you the scholarly definitions of that, but it's in the book. And I thought that I'd like to read you a couple of samples of these poems. I'll start off with a couple of samples of Pashto poetry. Sadly, it is in the work of Abdul Rahim Rauhani, who, passed, who was from Sindh and passed away just last year. His poetry speaks to how terrorism and political corruption have embroiled Pakhtuns in a conflict not of their making, ultimately transforming their society. And I have, um, and I worked with um, uh, Zeneb, um, Adnan and Anila Ad Adnan on um, translating the poetry. And what he writes, they take, their, they take your conscience, they take your faith, and they take your belief. They gave the peace-loving Pakhtuns a bad name for no real reason and made them fight jihad. What is tragic is that they have taken away Pakhtun's love for the things of this world. O oh Lord, shield your Satan, your shaitan, for these people are so satanic that they will take away the Pakhtun's fear of Satan. Another poem of his. The Khan is seated on one shoulder, the mullah, the religious leader on the other, and the peer is seated on my back and refuses to move. The three of them torment me. I don't earn as much for myself as I do for them. I feel battered by them, just as I batter my sitar. That was actually written by a dear friend of Royal Ghani's, uh, Usman Olasiar, who's founder of the Swastu Cultural Center in Mingwara Swat. But I have many other examples. I'm going to try to read some of the shorter poems. But um, I will say that, um, just one moment, as I'm looking at the poetry, Dr. Abbasin Yousafzai has a whole canon of amazing, powerful poetry. Here's one of his, it's called Ghazal, which is something that you sing, poetry you sing. This is by Abbasin Yousafzai, who's the head of the Pashto program at Islamia College inside of the University of Peshawar. He writes, why are the streets of Bagram deserted, the ever-chanting city silent? Why are Malakand and Tatara lying still? Why doesn't the shepherd's flute play in the hill? Many a sweet-throated nightingale sang here. Why are your musical lips pressed today? They did not let me speak a word. Why are Eids in the market days dull? Not a sound rises from the festive green. Why are the streams of every village so desolate, the clanking bowls of cheerful girls heard no more? 
And I think this really speaks to the kinds of concerns that Asma had raised too about how Pakistani society is changing so much. I want to, I want to share one more Pashto poem, and that is by Hasina Gul of Mardan. And she writes in, a, in another poem of hers, murderers, tyrants, enough. This land has turned scarlet with all the innocent blood that you have spilled. Eyes have run out of tears to cry at the cemeteries. Form a jirga to bring love to everyone. Peshawar will be young again. Nangahad will have spring again. Kabul will smile again. Even death is appalled by what you have done. Death was something to look forward to when the time was right, but you have taken people away before their time. We would look forward to being on our deathbeds and being surrounded by loved ones who would give us a peaceful send off. People would go to schools, they would live in harmony and unity and strangers were treated with ultimate respect. I would have been content that I lived a long, happy life, but murderers, tyrants, you have showered us with bullets of hate and sorrow. Please listen to me for a bit. Please rest your arms for a lot of blood has been, has been spilt. I thought it might be good to end this, this part with a, with a Cindy poem. Now, when I talk about the Cindy poems, well, even the Pashto poems, Pashto poems, I start off with some poetry of Raman Bhava, Sindhi poems with Sachal Sarmas and Shabda Latif Bhattai. And then I talk about the poetry of people today. And I want to read a poem of, just one moment, Let's see if I can find it, of, um, of a Pesha mom whose name is um, Hafiz Nizamani. Um, they're all so good. It's hard to, it's hard to select. I'm, I'm trying to look for a poem that really captures what, it really captures the dynamism behind Asma Jahangir's life and her work. And perhaps this one would be a good one. Not Christian, Jew, or Muslim, not Hindu, Buddhist, or any religion, I am a human being and bow down my head only to humanity. Tell the historians I'm not afraid of anything. I demand neither hoodies nor gilman. Looking at your ways of living, my soul cringes. If it's your religion, then I am with the devil. We have our own colors of guidance and faith. Hafiz will always be on the side of vice and dishonesty. And one last one. I think that's enough of this, that Cindy poetry. Um, as I mentioned before, it was in the section on music by Karan Khan, who is a Pashto musician. He's from Swat, but he lives in Peshawar now. Just got his doctorate, in fact, in, um, in Pashto from the, from the University of Peshawar. Um, his poetry is in, in what he sings. I'm always reminded of sort of like Bruce Springsteen. He's a balladeer. He talks about how society is changing. But he was asked to write the anthem for the Peshawar's only cricket team uh, two years ago. And I was really taken aback by what he wrote in that poem because it never even mentions cricket. It's about, let's take to the field, let's show the world who we are. Peshawar Zalni means the youth of Peshawar. And he's celebrating who we are and how we can show the world what we actually are instead of what people are saying about us. And it's that type of stance that really resonates with the youth of Peshawar that I think is breaking boundaries that people hadn't thought about before. So I hope that this was helpful. I thought that I would talk a little bit about the transformative impact of education 
in changing social values. I have sections on the um, Bachachan um, uh, education network in Khyber Pakhtankhwa and about the Zoya Science Schools in Southern Punjab that both provide absolutely top rate education, English medium education for free. But importantly, they also have a zero tolerance for violence and they teach peace. And also how religious leaders are, dead, are themselves taking stands to counter extremism and what they're actually doing. Um, but I thought that maybe this would be a good time for us to turn to Q&A. I know that a number of people have written in questions already. We have two um, esteemed scholars who would like to ask me some questions. So um, perhaps I'll conclude my prepared comments. I can always read more poetry. Um, and I will turn it back to Michael or Kesser, um, Joe Batkarna Chapehe. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Weiss. Uh, we have a lot of virtual applause uh, sounding right now. Uh, it was a really terrific, rich, inspiring, uh, hopeful uh, presentation that we heard. I know those are the types of things you hope that you wanted to convey in the book. Um, that really was terrific. Um, I, I have a few questions, and I, I certainly imagine that, that Kaiser may want to say some things well and pose uh, some questions as well before we go to the audience. But um, maybe I'll just um, pose a few initial ones, and then we can uh, we can go with that. I actually, my first question to you picks up on one of the very last things that you said before you finished your remarks there, uh, Dr. Weiss. Um, the extent to which we're seeing these local responses um, against extremism from the religious community, from religious leaders, and so on. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be curious, if, if you'd like, I'd be curious to hear some examples, or if you have any thoughts on, on that. And the second question is, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe that you had said towards the beginning of your presentation that um, when you speak with Pakistani friends about this research and this work, uh, many, if not most of them, are not familiar, uh, don't know about these local responses. And that's striking to me. I can understand why, you know, why many Americans wouldn't be familiar with these things. But in Pakistan, one would think that the, the state, uh, to say the least, would have an interest in getting these stories out there on a big level. So I would welcome your thoughts on why these stories that you're telling in this book are not more familiar to Pakistanis themselves. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave you, I'll let you answer those two questions first. Okay, I'll answer the second one first. Um, it's really funny. Somebody who I really admire and respect. Um, I don't know if I should give her name, but anyhow, somebody I really admire and respect, a scholar, social activist. She turned to me one day and said, I really wish that I had written this book because you know you really need to get down and really sit down with people and find out what's actually happening, what's actually germinating with them. As I said, many Pakistanis knew of some of these things, but nobody I met knew of all of these things that are happening. And I think that this is, frankly, this is part of the problem. This is part of the problem about how people think that they understand Pakistan. And that's something that really bothers me. I like your introductory uh, comments about me. <laughs> About, I mean, I have been doing research in Pakistan. I first got there in 1978. I have gone to, pa I have tried to go to Pakistan every year since 1985. Um, didn't go at all in 2020 because of the pandemic. And that was, you know, it, it was two years by the time I went back, but I did go back in mid September, you know, 2021. Um, because I feel that I'm so, I'm really, I'm grounded. I, I speak with women in the walled city. I, I, um, I mean, one of the most moving um, experiences I had was going with people from Batai Social Watch Advocacy to a village where they had been working. They, they had been called to this village because they're, because there were a lot of um, FIRs being lodged by one group against the other group. And 
uh, first investigative reports, people were being arrested, people were being killed because they were having such enmity. And BISPA became involved and I sat there and I listened a couple of times I went with them outside of Kherpur. And I was able to learn how they were getting people to actually start talking with each other to the point where this is like an ideal scenario today. The people had joined together, they had pooled their resources so they could purchase an ambulance in the event anybody in that area became ill and needed to be rushed to Kherpur about two hours away. Um, you know, for, for health care. I was really moved by that. Um, people really don't know about such activities. A lot of people who follow feminist, um, you know, feminist issues in Pakistan have heard of Khwendokwar because of its founder, Mariam, and, and other people involved. But unless you follow that stream of social activism, you may not have heard of Khwendokwar. Um, and people who know of Quendo Corps may not know of some of the amazing activities of the Irangi Pilot Project. So this is what I meant. And also the poetry. Um, you know, people tend to know poetry of their own language. Um, you know, Pashto speakers were thrilled that I was looking at Pashto resistance poetry, but they didn't know anything about Cindy and really vice versa. Um, people were telling me stereotypes of what's happening in Sindh. That was not my experience. I was, I was taken to a place outside of Ranipur, um, again, in Upper Sindh. Mm. I was told that in that area, that there was, um, there, used, there was a mosque. And it used to be a mosque. And on the other side of the wall, sharing a wall, was the Hindu temple. And the mosque had now been converted into a madrasa. So, you know, the ever intrepid sociologist goes, aha, now I'll find out what's really happening in syncretic, you know, multicultural sin. So I went there, I saw the Deo Bundy madrasa. I went to the other side of the wall. I, inter I met with the Pandit, Ji, the Pandit Ji who was there. And I said, okay, so please tell me, how has your life changed? How has the Hindu temple change because you have a Deo Bandi Madras on the other side. And he said, well, it's wonderful. They help us anytime we need help, you know, with repairs and they participate in our festivals. They invite us for, um, you know, for, for brunch on Fridays. They invite us for, to celebrate things with them. The boys are very respectful. And I'm like, what? I mean, all these other people had told me that so many madrasas coming into Sindh are changing the tone of Sindhi society. Sure, I'm not gonna say that it's not, but it was my experience that at least in Ranipur, it's not. So um, I think very few people outside of Pakistan know of hardly any of the things I was writing about. I wrote the book for Pakistanis. I want Pakistanis to acknowledge and see the stands that people are taking. I gave a talk at the Pashto Academy at Islamia College in Peshawar um, in October, I gave that talk. And I talked about the power of Pashto poetry, and the power of what it could convey. And Abbasin Yousafzai had assembled like you know, very quickly, about 150 students to listen to my talk. And at the end, they cheered me. And I think they cheered me because I was actually speaking to them and saying, through your poetry, you can have a powerful, provocative impact on the society around you. So I knew that I would forget your first question in answering the second one. Could you ask it again, please, Michael? Yeah, if you could just for, and thank you for that great answer to the first the first question. Uh, your experiences um, in your research with uh, how religious community, particularly religious leaders, have been responding to extremism. This was something I, frankly, I hadn't expected to write about, but it was when I, I mean, first. Um, I had met Dr. Kibla Yazab when he was teaching Islamic, Islamiyat at the University of Peshawar. 
at the beginning of my research. And soon after he was appointed the chairperson of the Council of Islamic Ideology. And I had known the former chairperson who had also helped me in previous research. Um, anyhow, in talking with him, I realized that there have been different people who were, had different visions in that role. And one of his visions was to try to build up interfaith harmony within Pakistan. So he gave me, as well as other people, gave me names of religious leaders in Peshawar and Karachi and Lahore, and I went there. And I found that in Lahore, there is a group of people, and of course I forgot their name off the top of my head, but it's, it's the Lahore Council for Religion, and it's actually headed by the Imam of the Badshai Mosque, Imam Abdul Khabir Azad, who is himself Deobandi. And when I met with him, you know, I had expected, you know, the old stereotype. I expected a lot of rigidness. I had expected this is Islam, it's this way and no way else. But instead, one, the man astounded me, impressed me. I had heard from other people how when there was an attack on the Christian, um, the, the Joseph colony, which is a Christian colony in Lahore, he had run there with other religious leaders. He stood there with his arms outstretched, standing in front of the Christians, facing the Muslim hordes who were coming to attack them. And he said, stop, this is not Islam. So this is what really inspired me to find out more about his activities. This also led me to, to meet Malana Zubair Ahmed Zahir, who is the head of the LA Hadith in Lahore. Again, another amazing man who has spent a great deal of his life in jail for protecting the rights of Christians. Now, why don't we know about these things? These are well known, these are, these are the big religious leaders, but nobody writes about their positive activities doing this. And I wrote about it because I found out about it. I hadn't known before. There's the faith friends in Peshawar that are doing that as well. Um, in Multan, there's another group that is trying to do this. I was really taken aback when I happened to be in Islamabad right before Christmas one year while I was doing this research. And because I was there, Dr. Kiblayaz, chairperson of the Council of Islamic Ideology, said that they were going to have a Christmas cake cutting ceremony inside the Council of Islamic Ideology. And he invited me there. And I was again so happily surprised. I found out from the other religious leaders who were there, religious leaders from every religion, every denomination. I mean, Shia, Sunni, um, Sikh, Hindu, Vareta, Vareta. Anyhow, so they were, they were saying to me that while they had had symbolic Christmas cake cutting ceremonies elsewhere, it had never actually been inside the Council of Islamic Ideology. And at the very end, he asked me to say some parting words, and I did, you know, ever the professors. <laughs> but I, I mean, my parting words were, I was very impressed by all of the positive messages that each and every le religious leader had delivered. And now the challenge is to take it back to your constituencies and share this with your constituencies. And everybody said, absolutely. So again, why do we not hear about this? I guess it doesn't make the news, but I was impressed. And I have a lot of examples that are in my book about this. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I, we have a number of questions that have come from the audience, but Kaiser, I wanted to invite you to pose, uh, if you'd like, a few questions or a sure. comment, uh, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anita, for your presentation and the wonderful book. Uh, when I was going through your book, I realized you met a lot of people in uh, urban areas, in rural areas, who are really not liked by the state. So I want to know when you were writing it, was the book censored or did you get any alerts, any threats 
that don't do it, don't meet these people, uh, these kind of things? Absolutely not. Oh, wow. No, nothing whatsoever. Mm. I think on the one hand, I've been going to Pakistan for a long time. There was one, was one section I myself was concerned about. I mean, yes, there was a lot. I mean, these, I'm writing about people who are taking a stance and saying, stop the violence, stop the extremism. And there are many questions in Pakistan about the provocateurs of the violence and extremism in certain areas. Mm -hmm. And that's all I say. I'm not writing about who these, provoc these provocateurs might be, right? But you can think about it. And I'm sure the last Asma Jahangir um, speaker, Aisha Siddiqui talked about them. <laughs> Anyhow, but for, in my case, all I was doing was interviewing people and documenting what they're doing. I'm not doing it, I'm documenting it. Mm -hmm. But there is one group that I feel that I uniquely understand in part because I'm American, and that is the Pakhtun Tahafiz movement, which is a movement for the protection of Pakhtuns. And I see it very much as an equivalent of Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter in the United States try to draw attention to discriminatory practices against Blacks, um, by the state, by police, by different actors. And this is really what the Pakhtun Tahafiz movement has tried to draw attention to. However, the big difference mm -hmm. is you can't talk about the PTN in Pakistan. You can't write about it, yeah. you can't talk about it. I interviewed some people. I made the judgment call not to interview the leadership of the PT, PTM. I interviewed other people who answered questions about it, but I said this for similar reasons. I did not go to Baluchistan. I did not go to Baluchistan. I did not interview people in Baluchistan for this, for the book. I interviewed some people elsewhere in Pakistan about situations in Baluchistan and especially Baluchi writers writing in Pashto, which is very common. And the reason I didn't go to Baluchistan is I didn't want to risk getting people in trouble that they would meet me and afterwards security officials would say to them, what were you talking about with that Memsab? Right. And I just decided that at this point for their safety, I should forego that. So too, I felt that my whole project I mean, I did not need to meet the leaders of the PTM because on the one hand, I could jeopardize them. Why are you meeting with this Memsab? On the other hand, also um, people would question more, why did I need to meet with them? And I realized I didn't. I read a lot of, I mean, a lot of New York Times news stories, but I also met with other people and read other things in the Pakistan news about <clears throat> the Tafas movement. I will say that, I mean, now the book's been out of, it, the book has been out now one year. So I can actually say it now that I put the section on the PTM in the middle of the last chapter, hoping that the censors in Pakistan would not read as far as the seventh chapter and would miss the discussion of the PTM. I also later on spoke with the executive director, um, Arshad, at Oxford University Press. And I said to him, I really appreciate that you never said anything about my including this section on the PTM. And he said it belonged there. So I appreciated his support for that as well. I mean, knowledge is knowledge, facts are facts, and we need to, we need to know what's really happening. Mm -hmm. And I didn't put a slant, I didn't put a bias, I just wrote about the facts. I hope Thank that you. your question. Thank you. Thanks, Anita. Well, Anita. thank you. Oh, please, go ahead. Hi. Uh, 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 it's a great book. Thank you very much. And uh, there has been a lot of progress in Pakistan. Uh, unfortunately, you are right that um, 
uh, it's not being reported uh, in Pakistan media and many and the different segments of population really do not uh, know anything uh, about what others are doing. Uh, so uh, two organizations which are great, doing great work one of them is Bachahan schools and the other one is the Zoya in South Punjab. And these two regions have really bear the, uh, bore the brunt of the, uh, uh, the militant activities. So uh, if you can talk a bit uh, about uh, these two, the work of these two institutions, I re really appreciate it. Thank you. Very happy to do so. I had thought I would, but then I thought I was talking for too long. Um, on the one hand, the Bacha Khan schools have the advantage that they can take some of the philosophy of Bacha Khan and incorporate it. And the philosophy is very, um, what's really ingrained in children is an appreciation of local culture, is also an appreciation of social activism and social activities. And they made a point everywhere I went, all the different principals I interviewed, teachers I interviewed, <clears throat> of saying we have a zero tolerance policy for violence, which in this culture, this society, in Pakhtun society, on the one hand, I can see it. On the other hand, that's not the stereotype that you know you often see young boys fighting with each other. But all of this ended up that I interviewed. I interviewed a lot of a lot of children. I mean, it was not formal interviews. I spoke with them. I talked with them. What do they value? Um, when Khadim Hussein, who was then the executive director of the Bacha Khan schools, he said to me, we teach them critical thinking. I'm like, come on, how do you teach them critical thinking? He said, so he, he said, look, a second grade class, we show them a flower and we ask the first child to describe what this is, they start. And then the next child has to add something new. And the next child has to add something new. And by the time you've gone halfway around the room, you realize that they actually are engaging in critical thinking. They're actually trying to think about how they can describe this differently. So I saw those kinds of <clears throat> questionings happening in some of the classes that I, that I attended. I think I went to six Bachachan schools in different parts of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Swat, Dargai, outside of Peshawar and other places like that. Anyhow, over the years, many, many years, I have gone to many, many schools throughout Pakistan. I mean, really, wherever I go, people ask me if I would come and talk to their students. I, if I have the time, if I'm able to, <coughs> sorry, I, I've been really sick and now I'm not. So, but I still have the cough. Um, anyhow, so I have interviewed students extensively all over Pakistan. I remember, <coughs> I remember in the walled city of, outside of the walled city of Lahore, when I was doing research on, when, on girls' lives there, what difference a good education makes. And I talked to girls about their, their ideas for the future and even boys in different boys' schools in the area. These are poor children who I had talked to. So similar class to the kinds of children who attend the Bacha Khan schools. And I said, what do you hope to do when you're, when you're an adult? It was always, I hope to have a good job. I hope to be able to support my parents well. I hope to have a good marriage, this type of thing. Which is what I have become used to as the, the norm, normative answers I get. But so different at the Bacha Khan schools. And also I should add at the Zoya Science Schools. Instead at the Bacha Khan Schools, I, and I write about this and I give some of these answers, I would say, what do you hope to do in your future? It was also always something that made a positive difference in their local society. It was not focused just on their own family or themselves. It was like, I hope to become a doctor 
to so that I could help my community, or I hope to become a pilot so I can help to make Pakistan safe. I know these are little nuanced things, but when you hear it from children, it really is quite different. So I found similar responses from the Zoya Science Schools. Yes, I did find responses from both groups of students to the, the horrors, the terrors that they had all experienced. At the Zoya Science School, every child there had experienced violence in some way. Somebody in their close community had been killed, mutilated, or what have you, because of the violence. Did it leave them with a, with, with a sense that they had to take vengeance? No. Instead, it left them with it the, because of the teaching of peace and the teaching of so and, and the emphasis on social responsibility. You get this sense from the kids that they're, they're really serious about what difference they could make. I asked older boys at both, at both education programs, what would they do if their friend, their brother, their cousin decided that they were fed up and they were going off to join the Taliban? What would they tell them? Now, I was ready because of 40 years spent in Pakistan, I was ready to hear them say, your mother will worry, you know, take care of yourself or something like this. But I was really impressed by so many of these answers that really emphasize social responsibility. You can't just take off. I mean, we all need to help Pakistan have a better future. Um, we're all frustrated, but we have to channel that in a positive way. And that's what they got from these education programs. And that's why I wrote about them, because I was impressed. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you both to Kaiser and Aftab for some great questions. And then thank you, uh, Dr. White, for some really thoughtful responses. So we have uh, uh, just under 30 minutes left, and we have many, many questions. And so what I'm trying to do is consolidate some of them into different types of groups of questions, different categories of questions. And I'll... Um, I'll pose a few to you. We'll do a few rounds, and hopefully we can get to uh, uh, to them to the extent that we can. And uh, certainly, Kaiser and Aftab should feel free to weigh in as they would like uh, the rest of the way here too. So, I think one set of questions, sort of essentially, was follow up uh, questions to your uh, to your comments about these expressions of uh, of uh, against extremism in Pakistan. And so, one of them is uh, what are the differences in expressions of counter-extremism along provincial and geographic lines? Do they target extremists directly or do they target potential bases of recruits? In other words, what is the target audience for these stands against extremism? And does that differ within different parts of, uh, uh, within different parts of the country? And the second question, that I'll pose in this category before turning things over to you. Actually, this is a very specific Michael, one. Oh, sorry. that's a great question. Can I just answer it? Yeah, because please. When you get to the second question, I'm <laughs> going to forget the first one, even though I wrote it down. Because uh, I think this is an important, I think what you just asked is really important. You said against extremism, differences along provincial lines. Um, they're not... I mean, the groups that I was writing about that I was meeting with, they're not trying to target the extremists. They're trying to build up a meaningful, cohesive society, perhaps more, a more syncretic society, which especially happens in sin. But I think the target, I think the target audience is themselves. The target audience is is regaining cultural authenticity and to say, this is who we really are. We're not that. I mean, so when the state claims that there's all these extremists in Wazidistan, these Pashto poets are standing up and saying, no, we're not. And there's something else that's going on that's not us. And those are not our values. Is that helpful? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think so. Thank you. Um, so the, another question, sort of related, it's a very specific question. Uh, how has the Paigami Pakistan Initiative been received within Pakistani society? And this is, of course, uh, 
I believe, the fatwa uh, against terrorism that the Pakistani government came out with, I think back in 2018, uh, right before the new government came into power. So it was the previous government. Uh, do ordinary Pakistanis know about this? Has it had any consequences on the way Pakistanis think about the issue of extremism? Okay, that's a very difficult question to answer for, for me personally. No. Let me explain. Paifame Pakistan is, is the new message of Pakistan. It was developed at the um, International Islamic University in Peshawar. The head of the Islamic Research <clears throat> Institute is doc, Professor Dr. Zia ul Haq. I keep telling him he needs to change his name because you know, <laughs> Zia ul Haq, but he's nothing sure. like that. I mean, sure. The man is a true scholar and had gone wide and far all over Pakistan, really tried to make this a grassroots efforts in a lot of local constituencies, especially working through universities to get input onto this new message of Pakistan. I would say that the changing government has had no, I'm not certain. Um, the, I met with him in October, no, I think November, so last month. Um, I don't believe that the change in government has had an impact at all on their activities. Having said that, the reason why it's hard for me to answer is because here I'm listening to another professor telling me about all these wonderful things that's happening with the Pakistan in Pakistan. They've written books about it. They're trying to publicize it. Do I think the masses in Pakistan know about it? No. Do I think most scholars in Pakistan know about it? Most scholars who are intellectually curious do, but I would say that many Maldives don't. So are there limitations for, for bringing this up? Absolutely. Now, do I, th I think that I might be talking in a way that people are not following and I'm happy to clarify if any of you think I should. Where the Pakistan <clears throat> state though seems to be heading has nothing to do with this new Pairami Pakistan. They've just appointed somebody I'm sorry, I forgot his actual title, but he's like the new ombudsperson for you know, religious authenticity. And, it, and many people who know, who know him, I've never met him, so I'm not gonna say anything, but many people who know him think that this is an absolute horrible choice um, because he does not take those stands of, of you know, a sala, a, you know, an authentic Muslim, I don't know. But I think that the path that Imran Khan seems to be trying to pursue in terms of a new, a new way of thinking about Islam in the state in Pakistan is, I just think it's loaded with political reasons for doing it and to me and to many other people, I probably shouldn't say this, I don't want to be PNG'd out of Pakistan, but to me and many other people, it seems to lack authenticity. <clears throat> then now I'm talking about what Imran Khan's new initiative is. I think Pairam in Pakistan would be wonderful if it would actually be something that could be brought further into universities, mm -hmm. into schools in Pakistan, but it's not. Mm -hmm. Uh, can I say something, Mike? Please, yes. Uh, I think uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Nita. Uh, I think fatwa is, is a good thing against extremism, terrorism, and it might affect many people. Uh, having said that, the whole environment is such that it won't affect the people who are indoctrinated in extremism. Look, there are 20,000, over 20,000 madrasas. And in provincial Khaybar Pakhtun Kho, Imran Khan governments have funded those. 
madrasa, that's a fact. So it's supported by the provincial government. Also, the new syllabus in, in schools is so horrible. We are the only one who are right. Everyone else is wrong in this world. And these kind of things, I don't think it will affect. These are so indoctrinated by these activities. Uh, it won't affect, any fatwa won't affect these kind of minds, I think. That's my view. About, about the fatwa. Pahana Pakistan is more than a fatwa. You know, it started from it. Now they did go to um, religious, Muslim religious leaders worldwide who have also taken out fatwas about, um, about religious extremism, about violence. I think that's a positive step. It's mm -hmm. better that such fatwas exist than don't. But there's also the question of fatwas themselves. I mean, who is allowed to issue a fatwa? Who should have issue a fatwa? These are things that all came up with the SWAT Taliban and Fazullah issuing fatwas every 10 minutes, you know? And he had no right authenticity whatsoever to do so. I think Pahran in Pakistan is a nice start and a nice intellectual start. But again, the indoctrination that happens at various madrasas and not, as you well pointed out, the, the new single national curriculum that's about to be promulgated in Pakistan teaches some very strange things and very unfortunate things about religion. Um, I have heard from so many religious leaders all over the country that they want actual courses to be taught about other religions. They want to inform Pakistanis about other religions, what other religions teach what they what their values are now why the state feels well it's their political agenda i mean this is really where imran khan you know he has always pandered to religious groups thinking that's where his vote bank was in the past before being elected i thought he would change that after being elected but he hasn't um in truth the single national curriculum is not what all these religious leaders who I interviewed would like to see. And that's very unfortunate. Um, again, there's different dynamics happening in Pakistan. All my book is saying is that there are some groups that are trying to do this. It's not, I mean, yes, there are many who are indoctrinated who don't who don't understand about speaking truth to power. You know, they just get caught up in that trope. And I think my personal opinion is that's unfortunate, but I think that people who are taking a stand, um, it takes a lot of courage to take a stand in that environment, but there's so many people doing it that we should not overlook that. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you. And all, the only thing I'll add to that is, is another layer of complexity that, um, you know, as we know, there are, so, there are a number of Pakistanis that are radicalized or become extremists um, without ever having attended a madrasa uh, or a religious institution or who don't appear to be particularly religious or pious and they're radicalized anyway. So it's such a complex uh, issue. Um, but thank you for that. I'm going to ask a question, you know, since we are the Wilson Center and our events, our events tend to attract those that are very interested in broader policy uh, implications um, of our discussions, particularly in terms of U.S. policy. So there are a number of questions along those lines. Um, one of them I'll pose to you, um, Dr. Weiss, and I hope you'll be able to uh, shed some light on it if, if you feel comfortable doing so. Looking at Afghanistan um, and how what you think the Taliban takeover there may mean for Pakistan's um, position toward extremism with its, within its own borders. In other words, how could what's happened in Afghanistan recently impact society in Pakistan, how it looks at, at extremism and how people respond to it? Uh, if you wanted to weigh in on that question. It's a great question. And I'm gonna answer it in two ways, okay? First is the question you asked about, um, about the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan. I know that there is a great 
great deal of concern within Pakistan. I mean, look, I just came back from Pakistan two and a half weeks ago. And I talked to a lot of people when I was there. There's a great deal of concern that the Taliban in Afghanistan are opening doors for extremism to flourish in Pakistan. And we have seen no indications on the part of Imran Khan's political government that they're not going to take a stand against this. I mean, that's the reality of it. Um, there was just a huge demonstration in Gwadar in Baluchistan for human rights, for jobs, for basic necessities. Um, we don't really know the outcome of it, but what I do know is that it has not been popularized. Most people don't know that that actually happened. So we have to remember though, <coughs> that within Pakistan, there are two powerful political entities. One is far more powerful than the other. One political entity is the state, the elected government and its bureaucracy. The other is the military. I need not say, well, I will say, you know, the military is far more powerful in terms of getting its uh, objectives realized in action. However, I'm not sure how the military comes up with, with its vision of a better society in Pakistan, its vision of what it would like to see in Pakistan. The military is adamant against, um, you know, I mean, it, it has tried to have, um, it, has, it has tried to block access from Pakistan to Afghanistan over the years. You know, it's tried to have a buffer zone there. But I, I don't know. I mean, there's been so much violence in that area. Many, many local people in those areas claim that the violence has been perpetrated by the military. I wasn't there to see it, so I don't know. Just saying what people have told me. And so it's questionable. You know, it seems that the military's biggest concerns have always been Afghanistan and India. They remain Afghanistan and India. On the other hand, it doesn't seem that the military is taking any action really, or action that I know of, to stop the spread of the kind of extremism that's happening in Afghanistan into Pakistan. As I said, many people are very concerned that the Taliban are being emboldened, the Pakistan Taliban are being emboldened by what they see happening in Afghanistan and they don't see the Pakistan state as taking a stand and saying this is wrong. But the question I thought you were asking about US policy is what can the United States, what role could the United States play in, um, in, counter, in viably countering extremism in Pakistan? I think very importantly, to listen to people within Pakistan. I had talked to some people at the US embassy. I had thought that they would invite me to give a talk there and they didn't because they have a whole CVE, Countering Violent Extremism Group, who ostensibly know what they're doing and sure, fine. But I don't know if I, from what I know what they're doing. I mean, you can create Americans cannot create programs and say to Pakistanis, let's do this. Like they, like the Burqa Avenger, I mentioned it briefly in my book. It was, you know, it, um, thousands if not millions of dollars on this comic book series to try to promote a positive image of fighting against extremism. Come on, who are you going? Why not look at what Pakistanis themselves are doing and in whatever, in limited capacities, because you don't wanna take it over. But I'm thinking of the walls of Karachi, for example. There was this Rangda Karachi movement morphed into the walls of Karachi. And then finally the US embassy started to give them some type of support. And what they were doing is they were putting images of peace on the wall, literally painting images of peace on the walls of Karachi to cover over hate language, which I think is wonderful. Um, 
But if you think that Americans are going to create policies that are like, that this is the way to counter extremism, that, that's just not going to work. You need to listen to what Pakistanis themselves are doing and stands that they're taking and I think be supportive of them. I don't know. I don't know if that made any sense. It did. And you did anticipate the next question I was going to ask. It was about what should U.S. policy look like or should there be a U.S. policy? I think you've, you made some very good points. And as I understand it, another uh, constraint for U.S. policymakers is that by providing support to civil society groups trying to take on extremism, you risk making those groups radioactive in the sense if the word gets out that these groups are getting money from the U.S., that'll defeat the very purpose of what you're trying to do. Um, you're welcome to respond to that, but that seems to be a, a constraint and has been there for quite some time, right? I absolutely agree, but I think one thing is that it's not just about providing money and funds. Right. I mean, right? It, it's about narratives. It's about discourses. It's about there really are exciting, positive things happening within Pakistan today. And very few people within Pakistan, outside of Pakistan, even know about this. I'm just saying that the more we know, um, the better the vision can be. I completely agree, though, about um, not one thing the United States tends to do is when they when they support funding, I mean, when they provide funding, they sometimes end up taking over. Um, I'm really impressed by the activities of the Open Society, um, you know, FASIP, the Foundation of the Open Society in Pakistan, what they had done in the past. They had gone out to NGOs, to local groups and said, what do you need to help to build an open society? People have given them proposals. They've given them support, funding support, but that was it. They didn't take over the group. And I think the more the U.S. can follow that pathway, the better off that will be. Well, thank you. Um, one final question um, from the audience before we start to wrapping up. This has been a great discussion. It gets back to current affairs. Uh, the Pakistani Taliban, uh, as I think much of this audience will know, the Pakistani state recently held talks with the Pakistani Taliban, which has been a, uh, a horrific uh, anti-state group with some terrible things over the years. There was a one month truce and the Pakistani Taliban recently said that it's not going to extend the, tru the truce and it's picked up attacks in Pakistan again. The question is, what is your sense as to how Pakistani civil society views the decision on the part of the Pakistani state to negotiate with the Pakistani Taliban and how influential might Pakistani civil society's views be vis-a-vis -vis the state on the decision to negotiate with the TTP? This is That's a great a tough question. One. No, it's a great question because I was in Pakistan at this time. I was in Pakistan, I was staying at the government college university foreign faculty guest house, which is right by Anarkali in Lahore. At the time that a different group, tariq e Pakistan, the TLP, um, announced they were about to do a long march on Islamabad. I was right near where they killed seven policemen in Lahore. And <coughs> um, their, their leader, their former leader, Khadim Hussein, who died of COVID earlier this year or the end of last year, his death anniversary is coming up. So after all this that the Tariq e Labayek did and killing police officers and everything, they release Khadim Hussein Rizvi's son from prison. The state has said that they will pay for his wars, his death anniversary, and make it into a big deal. Who is this state? I mean, this is, this is not the state many of us signed up for to have, number one. This is a state that is celebrating an extremist terrorist violent group that actually waged war against the state itself. That's number one. And then we go, similarly, the same week this came out, 
that Imran Khan said, well, we're going to talk with the Pakistan Taliban, and if they agree to lay down their arms, we will give them amnesty. Well, I've spent a great deal of time in SWAT, and I spoke to some people who I know from SWAT right after this happened. One woman had told me at the time I was doing research on women's lives in SWAT, what happened during the time of the Taliban. One woman at the time had told me that her husband was hung in the public square in Mata, in Upper Swat, um, because he opposed the Taliban. There is no way. I mean, another person who knows that woman said to me, there is no way that the state has the option to give them asylum, to give them amnesty. I'm not asylum, amnesty, because this action was against that woman and her family. They killed her husband only because he opposed them and they were an illegal group that the state was ostensibly opposing as well. And this was the reaction. I spent some time in a working class area. It's called Parani Anarkali in Lahore. And I was meeting with, I must have met with 15 people there. And we were all talking about what Imran Khan had said about the Taliban. And each and every person said he has no right to talk about giving them amnesty because this is, you know, this is a, one person came up with the point, such a thing as a truth and reconciliation commission like they had in South Africa. You could think about something like that, that an individual themselves denouncing the role that they played, that's one thing. But to give total, total, amnesty to a heinous organization that has, that has perpetrated such violence against the Pakistani people and allowing it to stay intact as an organization, this is not the actions of a state that cares about its people. Well, thank you for that. Uh, and I know that many in Pakistan distinguish between the Pakistani Taliban and the Afghan Taliban, which they feel uh, obviously very different context, but in that case, negotiations made sense. Um, at any rate, uh, thank you for that. Um, we're gonna have to wrap up. And before we do, I wanted to see if, if Kaiser or Aftab had any brief final comments uh, to make before we wrap up, but this has been a terrific uh, conversation, um, Dr. Weiss and you know, at the Wilson Center, one of the things we like to do is to look at Pakistan and the other countries that we focus on with as broad a lens as possible. And the fact that you brought out some really important but under uh, noted, under addressed stories like these local responses to extremism, so important. Um, and uh, certainly I recommend that those of you out there, uh, to the extent that you can read, read the book, uh, there it is that she has produced, Countering Violent Extremism in Pakistan. Um, Kaiser, Aftab, did you want to make any very quick final comments, very quick, before we close? Uh, yes, uh, please. Uh, Dr. Anita Weiss, thank you very much for really bringing to the fore uh, the real work that is being done at the grassroots le levels in Pakistan. And I'm so glad to see all that positive work. Uh, and I'm very sorry uh, to say that the Imran Khan's government's policy uh, regarding uh, the uh, Tariq al uh is uh, really absolutely wrong and it is not being supported uh, by the vast majority in Pakistan. Uh, but thank you very much for bringing uh, the, the real good stories about it. Thank you. I think you're muted, uh, Kaiser. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Anita, for showing us the other side of the story, other side of the picture that we don't see much. Uh, we all the time hear about what's going on in the newspapers and media, but we don't hear about it. Well, thank you, uh, Wilson Center and Michael Kogelman. And I, I would like to thank you, the listeners, the watchers who participated in this wonderful discussion. Thank you all. Yeah, thanks a lot. I want to thank uh, Kaiser and Aftab um, for, and South Asia Democracy Watch for being a, a wonderful partner for this. We look forward to next year's lecture. Please look out for the, the announcement on that in the months ahead. 
Uh, thank you to the audience for some terrific questions. And of course, thank you to Dr. Weiss for some really insightful and in and, and many cases inspiring uh, comments. Um, so thank you all. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, we are going to adjourn now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks. you for inviting me. Thanks.